And welcome everybody to this week's Maternity and Midwifery Hour. This is session four, season six, and, and I'm delighted to be with you this, this evening. And welcome to the midwives, the student midwives, the mums and dads, because I understand there's going to be a few mums and dads who, who are listening in and, or, and watching, which is fantastic. Um, and also teachers we're going to have a huge audience I hope today and I hope you're going to find it really useful now of course you know that every session is recorded so that if you miss this if you're say on call and you have to go and, and answer a call or if you only get to see half of this or you want to see it all over again it's all recorded all accessible all free and share it with your friends because this is going to have really interesting and useful information this evening as always now, this evening, and, and I should have introduced myself, how dreadful. My name's Sue MacDonald, and I'm the curator for the Maternity and Midwifery Hour and the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals, and it's my delight to be the chair this evening. And I've got two leading neonatologists this evening, Professor Paul Clark and, and Dr. Paul Corley, so two Pauls this evening um, and it's really fantastic what they're going to be talking about and as we always do with our guests we're going to put them on the spot and ask them for a moment of the week to be shared and we're going to start with Paul Corley because I know he's got a good moment. Uh, <laughs> well uh, I've recently received a new puppy and I'd say my moment of the week has to be uh, when I got three hours of uninterrupted sleep without the puppy whining so um, not moaning <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like having a new baby. Yeah, in very, yeah. <laughs> very many ways. <laughs> Certainly lots of cuddles. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, thank you for that. How about Paul Clark? Do you have a similarly pleasing moment of the week? Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Sue. Um, my highlight of the week so far has been receiving a personalised invite from my, my youngest baby, who turns 13 next week. So she's invited me to her teenage birthday party which is oh, really wow. beautifully illustrated wow that's a special moment too thank you that's a great way to start thank you okay well we're going to just start with the usual sort of welcome and I'm reminding people this is a, this Matflix runs this and we're going to be talking about a new feature right at the end of the show about Matflix but you'll know these are all recorded and this is all accessible for students for midwives and for nurses, and for anyone who's in maternity services or looking after mums or babies. And we started this a couple of years ago on the onset of the pandemic, really to help people be able to have some digestible, interesting news at a time when it was difficult to get face-to-face -face events. Obviously, we couldn't do face-to-face -face events at that point. Um, and it's proved to be very useful and interesting for people. So we've carried on and we hope that you'll be able to use it if you've got, say, a project to be done, a dissertation, um, a, a, a sort of um, something to share presentation with colleagues, anything like that. You can get a huge back catalogue of loads of presentations and they're all contemporary and really useful. So I just, again, say a big thank you to everyone in the services. Every, and we know the NHS at the moment is really pressured. Everyone's working really hard. Quite a few people are off sick, so people have to cover for their colleagues. And we just say, say at this point a big thank you. We know it's hard for, for people. And what's fantastic is the service is still being provided. And I especially, I'm, I'm obviously focused on mothers and babies and families and their their what their care is is remaining at a high quality which is fantastic um, and people are tired and stressed and I'll also say at this point as I always say look after yourselves look after yourselves and get your rest and when you can um, because you're valuable and you, you're needed where you are right I'm moving on. I'm I'm scampering along this evening because I want to give lots of time to the two Pauls for talking about these babies um, but I'm just going to do a little bit of news. So there's still a focus on ensuring women have up to date information about the COVID-19 vaccine and be encouraged to take it up. We know this week that the NHS, um, the Minister of Health has decided not to um, have mandatory vet vaccines for NHS employees as yet. And there's going to be a consultation 
but we still need to think about our evidence base and why we might need to have a vaccine ourselves. And if you're anxious, there are lots of NHS drop-in um, vaccine daily Q&A sessions, which can be very useful for you. There's also, just a little heads up, the fourth health and social care workforce study, which is closing on the 4th of February. There's a link in the resources sheet. You'll remember that this is a project that's been ongoing. This is number four bit of it. So it's looking at your experience through the last couple of years. So if you want to input, that's your way. Now this month, it's Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Trans Month uh, hist and History Month. It's also today is World Wetlands Day. I like to have something a bit different. Tomorrow, it's UNICEF Day of Change. And the fourth, it's uh, World Cancer Day. So it's quite a, a full week, really. And I think that's all the news I've got because I'm, I'm very determined to have as much as possible with these little babies. Now, this last week we were looking at personalised care and we're taking it a little, a little step further, I think, having looked at some of the publications that both our Pauls have been involved with. This is very much looking at making care really personalised for mums and babies and families. And we're going to be looking at babies and very preterm babies. And this whole, pro whole um, subject this evening is delivery room cuddles for preterm babies. And I'm delighted that we've got two leading lights to share their expertise with us. And to start with Dr. Paul Clark, who's professor and consultant neonatologist and researcher at Norfolk and Norwich University Hospitals, trained in Manchester and Liverpool, spent time in Australia as a neonatal fellow, but we had him back. He's got a strong interest in clinical research and gained his Doctor of Medicine and his thesis was on vitamin K status of preterm infants. So welcome, Paul. The screen is now yours. Thank you very much, Sue. It's a real pleasure to speak this evening to you all. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Sue for the invite. Um, we've given this talk um, over the last year to um, different neonatal doctors and nurses, but this is the first time we've had the opportunity to speak directly to midwives, so it's a real privilege for us. So we're going to speak about what, why and who of delivery room cuddles for extremely preterm babies and the parents. Um, I'm going to concentrate on these three and my colleague Paul will concentrate on the how, how to go about it. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, let's define the delivery room cuddle. What do we mean by that? It's also known by some as the birthday cuddle. We're really here referring to the chance for a mother to cuddle her preterm newborn before his or her admission to the neonatal unit and our facilitation of this. So what we mean is that the mother's enabled to cuddle her baby in her arms or on a chest instead of us just showing the preterm baby to her before we whisk the baby away to the neonatal unit. So the, the cuddle may appear only a relatively trivial event to some professionals, but it's actually a, often a huge event in the life of a parent and a preterm baby in their journey. So it typically will follow initial resuscitation or stabilization in the delivery room. The duration as we practice it, it's usually around five or 10 minutes. Sometimes it's briefer than that, sometimes it's longer, but on average it's five or 10 minutes. We aim to practice it wherever and whenever possible and irrespective of birth gestation. So our talk today is going to focus on the practice of offering the delivery room cuddle for extremely preterm babies. Not because there's anything particularly special about extreme pre prematurity, but if we can demonstrate that we can do it safely and facilitate it practically in the most extreme preterm babies, then there's certainly no reason why we shouldn't be offering it for all preterm babies. So I'm going to start with parents and end with parents, my, my session. So here, first of all, directly from Emma. Um, she's a mom of extremely preterm twins um, and has a, a very brief few minutes where she tells her story directly. They say from the first time you hold your baby, you will never be the same. Your life changes. The love you feel and the emotion is overwhelming. When you have an extremely premature baby, you wish with all your heart that you could experience that flood of emotion the moment they're placed in your arms. You would give anything to hold them the way you have dreamt. 
Most mums of premature babies don't have the opportunity. They may have to wait weeks, months, or may never get to hold their baby while they're still alive. At 23 weeks pregnant, I was expecting twins. Charlie was shown to me and taken away to the neonatal unit, as I was still in labour with his brother Jack. Jack had a more difficult birth, and it took some time to intubate him. This was extremely distressing for us. Once Jack had been stabilised, the consultant asked me if I would like to hold him before they took him to the unit. I instinctively knew this wouldn't be something I'd get to do again any time soon. Holding my baby in my arms was one of the most special moments in my life. He was so tiny, so perfect in every way, and never in my life have I been so proud and felt so much love. I was completely overwhelmed with emotion. Would any mother turn down the chance to hold their baby for the first time? Jack died from an infection after only 11 days of life. The only other time I got to hold my baby was as he died in my arms. I still find it difficult to speak about to this day, but the cuddle I had when he was born is something I will treasure forever. Jack's twin brother Charlie very nearly didn't survive. It's been a long journey to get him where he is today. He's a happy, healthy and crazy little boy with so much character. He's now 14 years old. Since the birth of my sons, I've been told that being able to hold your premature baby isn't something that every consultant offers. And to be honest, this surprises me. I needed to tell my story to raise awareness about just how much that first cuddle means as a mum. 14 years later, and this still isn't common practice. So thank you to Emma for her touching and beautiful words which puts it all into perspective what this whole concept is about. So we're actually in an enlightened era of family-centred care now and we know that optimal health outcomes are achieved when a baby's family members are able and enabled to play an active role in providing the emotional, social and developmental support for the baby. And this active role of parents in providing such support should start right from birth for all babies. We believe that enabling the delivery and cuddle is an ideal way to promote a partnership between the parents and healthcare professionals in the care of the preterm baby from the very outset. If we allow and facilitate mums and dads the chance to cuddle their baby before the baby's neonatal unit admission, that will begin the partnership and can have many benefits. The practice is feasible, can be done safely and is beneficial. We believe it can and should be practiced for most babies born preterm for their benefit and for the benefit of their parents. So what are the potential benefits of delivery room cuddles? Well, we already know there's a mass of evidence for the benefits of kangaroo care and direct skin to skin contact. And they're multifold and they include physiological and behavioral benefits. So better thermal stability for the preterm babies, better sleep, augmented breastfeeding rates, early discharge home, and better growth and development. But there are also psychological benefits as well from the parent's perspective, such as more positive feelings towards the baby, lower maternal stress levels, and more confidence in being able to meet the baby's needs. Now, while for extremely preterm babies, the delivery room cuddle, as we practice it, doesn't involve direct, complete skin-to-skin -skin contact, because inevitably the baby's been received into a polythene bag and is swaddled, we believe that some of the benefits are likely to be very similar to those of kangaroo cur. It's, it's no surprise to all of you listening that um, right after birth is an early sensitive period. We know the first minutes and hours, hours after birth are really important for the formation of a tight bond between mother and infant. 
The concept of this early sensitive period was first introduced more than four decades ago. It's a period characterized by a special neuroendocrine situation, probably mediated by oxytocin and prolactin. It's a unique period of increased maternal sensitivity and responsiveness. And if we can facilitate contact between mother and baby in this period, it may improve the quality of the mother preterm baby interactions and increase the chance of long-term secure attachment. So why should we try and practice delivering cuddles? Well, first and foremost, mothers and fathers want to cuddle their newborns. Indeed, cuddling the baby in arms after birth is instinctive for parents. We already know that abrupt separation and removal to the neonatal unit of a baby who's already been with mother for more than six months is traumatic, and that's mutually traumatic. A calm, supervised initial cuddle, on the other hand, is a marvellous opportunity for us to provide initial reassurance for those parents, for them to meet and form an initial ex utero bond with their baby, and indeed for the baby to feel a first loving embrace. So the parents are then able to touch and kiss the baby, and with our help, they can get the first family photograph and first family video together in those precious moments. We strongly believe there's an imperative that we should try and practice it for the highest risk babies. Unfortunately, it's not still common practice. So Emma in her um, section then said 14 years on, we're now talking about 15 years on. We know that on neonatal unit admission, these extremely preterm babies, they're immediately weighed, then incarcerated in incubators and effectively shackled to multiple items of equipment. And all these things effectively preclude early contact and early getting the baby out for cuddles. We already know that if a baby's not allowed the cuddle with the mum before the neonatal unit admission, it's invariably many, many days, if not weeks, before a first cuddle becomes possible. I believe that initial cuddle is especially important for extremely preterm babies because they're at the highest risk of dying and that can happen suddenly and unexpectedly. So it's a real tragedy if that first cuddle is offered only when a baby is dying on the neonatal unit or when they're terminally ill. And we know from experience that many parents out of sheer grief simply cannot bear to hold their baby in such circumstances. And thereafter, they may live with lifelong grief and guilt that they didn't, um, weren't able to hold the baby in such circumstances. So it's a real disaster for all if a baby dies suddenly, never cuddled. So why is it not yet routine in neonatal units in this new century? Well, we've never done it traditionally. We've always felt that there's an immediate imperative to quickly get the baby as fast as possible around to the neonatal unit. There's really been an absent literature and guidance and published evidence of the safety and outcome data that is until very recently. There's actually been very few trials given evidence for the practice. I think fundamentally, we've also had a, a lack of um, solicitation of feedback from parents, actually listening to what parents want and need in this situation. Well, I'm pleased to say it is now becoming more and more routine practice in more and more UK centres. Where it is practised, I can say without doubt, it's been unanimously supported by neonatal nurses and midwives in our own experience. So it's been my own personal practice for more than 20 years. What about the safety? So first and foremost, first do, not, do no harm. We, we certainly don't want to be compromising extremely preterm babies. But it's been practiced in our own centre in Norwich for more than 16 years now, irrespective of birth gestation. A bit patchy initially, but it's the norm now. And we don't think twice about it. It's, it's routine to offer it um, to parents and facilitate it for them. So to try and gather some evidence on the short-term safety outcomes, I did a retrospective review over a 12-year period between 2006 and 2017. And this was a case control, control study comparing short-term outcomes of inborn extremely preterm babies born at less than 27 weeks gestation who'd had a maternal cuddle at birth. We could, compared those babies with a match control group of inborn babies of the same gestation um, who are only shown to the parents before the neonatal unit admission. And in summary, this is what we found. We found that there was no significant difference in the time of neonatal unit admission or in the baby's admission temperatures on arrival at the neonatal unit. And there was no difference in mortality. So the conclusion was from this small review, um, case control review, was that offering parents a brief delivery and cuddle of their extremely preterm baby prior to the baby's admission did not significantly delay the baby's admission, nor did it adversely affect neonatal admission temperatures. So when we talk about the cuddles, who should benefit from the cuddle and for which baby should we try and facilitate the cuddle? 
Well, in answer to that, we would say most babies, and the vast majority that is, of any gestation should be considered eligible until pro proven otherwise. And this should include pre-viable babies. Um, it should also include babies with anticipated severe congenital abnormalities where postnatal survival is likely to be uncertain, maybe especially important for these babies. There are some babies where it's probably not indicated or contraindicated. So obviously if the mother's been delivered um, by cesarean under general anesthetic, it's, it's not gonna be possible in those circumstances. Th though we mustn't forget fathers in those situations and um, allow the father to have the cuddle before the baby's taken to the unit. If the mother's acutely unwell for whatever reason or needing medical stabilization, then obviously her needs take priority and it's, it, it won't be uh, possible in many such circumstances until she's been stabilized, may never be possible in such circumstances. If the baby's got expected or an unexpected airway, congenital airway malformation, then it's, it may not be possible. And similarly, if there's prolonged need for ongoing resuscitation, such as need for more volume or inotropic support, then those um, emergency medical care will take priority as well. But that's the exception of situations. Most of the time we're talking about when the baby's been stabilized in the first 10, 20 minutes following delivery. There are some more challenging, challenging situations which we would not regard as absolute contraindications to delivery and cuddle, such as awake cesarean section, um, birth of multiples, if the baby's got um, expected or unexpected um, cyanotic congenital heart disease, if the baby's bor born encephalopathic and is required active cooling, um, and also congenital surgical anomalies. And there was a nice recent paper published just a week or two ago reporting um, from St. Mary's unit in Manchester, a series of babies with a whole variety of neonatal surgical conditions where they've routinely practiced the delivery and cuddle for. And that's open access and the paper can be downloaded from that link there. So it's all about parents, this, and their babies. And we really, really need to know what parents think about the practice and what it means to them and whether they value it or not, whether they think it's important. So we, we sought to get some first feedback from parents. We did a questionnaire survey in June 2018, looking back and surveying um, the parents who'd had a delivery and cuddle in the period between 2006 and 2017. Um, altogether, we identified um, 22 mothers of living babies. We didn't invite the bereaved um, mothers to, to participate in this survey. We had 12 responses altogether. Um, and the questions we asked were with these. So first of all, we asked how important was that first cuddle to you as the mother of a very premature baby? And we asked them to rate on a Likert scale between not at all important and extremely important. And these were the responses we got. The vast majority felt it was an extremely important moment for them and their baby's lives. We asked them how important that they, did they consider it that the neonatal doctors and nurses, and we, and we should and would add midwives here, uh, we try to offer an initial delivery and cuddle before the baby's taken away to the neonatal unit. Again, we asked them to rate between not at all important and extremely important. And again, the vast majority felt it was really important, extremely important that we try and give that initial cuddle before the baby's taken to the unit. We asked them to comment um, if they wanted to, what the first cuddle with the baby meant to them. And here's what some of the comments we got back from the mums. So one said, making that initial cuddle as close as it could have been to had he been, had he gone to full term to make it feel normal was great. Another mum of a 26 week gestation boy said, it was incredibly important as I did not get to hold my son again for two weeks after his admission because he was too sick. So that initial cuddle helped to initiate my breast milk and I was able to express and eventually breastfeed my son when he was stronger. We got some lovely feedback from mum of a 23 week twin girls um, who, where she'd been able to have cuddles with both of them. And she commented, I got a cuddle with both. It was so beneficial to hear them cry and to stop and have that first cuddle was what we needed as I wasn't gonna have another cuddle for a while. And to have that first cuddle, I felt like a mummy. And I was very thankful because I didn't get another cuddle until 24 days later, which again was very emotional to see them and touch them. Maybe it was that first touch was what all we needed, knowing it was gonna be a really tough journey ahead. I was, and I'm so grateful to have had that first cuddle. And luckily I got that chance. I really hope this becomes the normal thing to have straight after delivering. It's such a powerful connection you have, even at that early on time. And I feel that is part of why the girls have done so well because of as much skin to skin I could do from the minute I could. 
I'd just like to um, round off my talk by illustrating a couple of video clips here, just showing the cuddle in action in real life. And the, these clips, precious clips, are shared with the kind permission of um, the parents involved. Um, so two, two different babies here, both um, by chance, both born at 22 weeks and six days gestation. So here's the first little baby born in July 2018. It's a real privilege for me to be at this delivery. Um, so I'm just going to play this and I'll apologize in advance for the beeps of the monitors. It's something you only realize is going on in, in retrospect, but if you can try and hear through the beeps. So the baby's about 26 minutes postnatal here and it's just being handed to mum. Early days. So what we'll do when we get round, we need to put some special lines in okay. his tummy button so we can give him some sugar solution mm -hmm. and then some liquid feed as well. Okay. And really important will be, are you planning to breastfeed? Have you thought about that? Yeah. That'll be really crucial if okay. we can get work on you know, overnight, mm -hmm. get some milk expressing and then we can trickle that down into his tummy. Okay. Um, we'll be doing an x-ray to check the position of the lines. Okay. Um, then just here we go, minute to minute, hour to hour, and so far so good. We, we couldn't have hoped for a better you know, state of him to start with. He's super. In good weight as well. We'll weigh him when we get round. Yeah, do you know? We you don't lose know. weight yet. Okay. Um, but as soon as we get round, we'll be able to weigh him and then let you know what it is. So precious moments and were the mm. part of it. It's a real privilege to, to be there. Um, this was recorded on the dad's mobile phone. So although obviously we can't in our trust record on our own mobile phones, there's nothing to stop us offering to take photos and videos with the parents' own mobile phones. And the footage is so kindly shared for you all from these parents. So Sheila, the mum in this picture, remember this is 22 week gestation boy, odds stacked against them at the time before admission. But this little lad came through it all and he's now three and a half years of age. Um, and th these are Sheila's words, considering how unclear the outcome of his birth was, I can honestly say that cuddling my little lad was probably the most encouraging factor in deciding to express milk for him. And there he is, he was on holiday um, at the age of three and a half years, just a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, the other thing that's really important to recognise here is that we, we don't know, we can't predict the future which baby is going to survive and which aren't. Um, and it, it's really important to stress that even a short cuddle, even if it's just seconds or a few minutes, it's really cherished long after the loss of a baby. So again, shared with really kind permission, um, this is Constance and her little baby was born last May, same gestation, 22 weeks and six days gestation for 60 grams. And this footage is taken on her phone at 20 minutes postnatal. Um, I was very lucky in the delivery room that night. Again, to, it was a real privilege to be there. I was the consultant present and had such a great team of neonatal doctors and nurses with me. I, I was effectively redundant. So the team did all the intubations and stabilization. And I, I was able to act as the, the cameraman for the mum with, with her permission and willingness. Um, so here we go. Yeah. <laughs> 
So again, thank you so much to Constance and Sonny. Um, at the time this clip was taken, um, Sonny, the father, was two hours away at the hospital, which the mum was transferred in from, um, looking after their other children. And he wasn't aware of the delivery at this time. Um, and it's so sad, the out outcome here. This, this poor little, little, um, little girl died just four days later. Um, and here's Constance words. She says, I'm Sonny, most grateful for the opportunity to have had a birthday cuddle. I like words to appreciate you for those pictures and videos. They are our forever cherished treasures of her sweet memory. It serves as a means to alleviate our pains on those bad days or the highest moment of grief and makes those days feel better. The short period of cuddling is better than none at all. If life presents such unpredictable situations, it creates lovely or even a happy moment to cherish in the future. One of the parents you took, whoops, sorry, one of the pictures you took is the only and closest shot of her beautiful pink, lively face before she became poorly days after. So thank you, Constance. And again, I'd like to, I started with parents, I started with Emma, and hers, this is Emma um, 16 years ago with her partner. Um, and these are Emma's words. Remember, Charlie survived, Jack didn't. Emma says, a cuddle is so important. Being able to hold Jack right off the birth meant the world to me and was so special. It's the hardest thing in the world not having your baby near you after delivery. You hold on to that one cuddle you've had. That cuddle I had with Jack when he was born meant so much and all mums should have this opportunity. That's how I'd like to end. All mums should have this opportunity. So I'd just like to thank the, all those parents without which we'd have no talk and um, we wouldn't be able to share this presentation with you. And I'd like to thank all my midwifery colleagues in Norwich and doctors and nurse colleagues here in Norwich who've been a unanimous support of this practice over many years. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, um, Dr. Paul Corley, who's going to tell you about the how and practicalities of delivery and cuddle. Oh, before you do, I have to introduce him in a proper way. <laughs> the same way thank you but thank you that that was lovely Paul it, it meant so much to finish with the parents who really need to be at the heart of all the things that we do so thank you so much it's very well I was going from smiles to to tears really it's very very moving as it, it will be so Dr Paul Corley is with us and as our next speaker and I'm going to skip through his introduction swiftly He's uh, studied uh, medicine at Guy's, King's and Tommy's and um, medical school, completed postgraduate paediatric and neonatology at Cambridge, um, Norwich and Bristol. And his clinical and research interest is optimization of early newborn care, which is very handy here, plus thermoregulation. And he's also authored the first hour of care neonatal manual that many of you will be aware of. Um, he's currently a neonatologist at the Evelina Evelina Children's Hospital St Thomas's and a CNDD MRC Clinical Research Fellow with King's College London, where he's working to investigate and develop novel non-ionising imaging techniques for perinatal brain development and neonatal brain injury. Paul, the screen is now yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just check, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Thank you very much. Um, it, it's a real honour. Um, I think seeing and, and hearing from, from Paul presenting those stories from the parents, how powerful and important this topic is. And I, I know both me and Paul are, are very grateful to have this opportunity to share with um, you an audience of, of, of midwives uh, and parents because it's to get this done, it needs a team effort. Um, and it's really valuable to be able to share our experiences and, and learning from doing this with, with um, maternity services. So thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, I normally like to start my presentation with the title, An ABC of Specialist Early Newborn Care. And um, in this, I, I like to redefine 
the acronym ABC to Airway Breathing Cuddle to highlight the importance of this, this contact between mother and baby. Uh, and also hopefully to portray that um, if you're systematic and methodical, um, it can be relatively simple to achieve this. So through this session, I think I'll start with just exp exp expressing some of my personal experiences and motivations for, for why I do this and look to practice this with my teams. Um, we'll think about the risks related to doing the delivery room cuddle and some of the practical aspects to that. Uh, and I think hopefully round off, you'll see that by, by ensuring good practice in the delivery room and, and achieving cuddles, we actually meet high evidence-based standards that underpin our early newborn care. So my real motivation um, stems from hearing Charlie and Jack's story, uh, which was the first case report of this practice in, in Acts Pediatrica from Paul. And ever since I've been personally motivated to give every baby in my care a delivery and cuddle whenever it's safe to do so. And um, I can tell you that it, it feels very natural and right to provide this cuddle. And in, in the rare circumstances where it isn't possible, there are some, it does feel uncomfortable and not right. Um, I think I've alluded as well that I, I think we all try to um, maintain high evidence-based standards and provide the best care to the babies we serve. And that's another motivation for me. And uh, I've always been aware, and I think um, there's a good long-standing evidence base relating to um, kangaroo care and skin-to-skin -skin care and neonatal neurodevelopmental outcomes. So I, I like to share this paper. It's back from 1991, even then. Um, small babies as, as small as 770 grams were having skin to skin care, not cuddles, but in, in the delivery room, but skin to skin care, and had physiological stability uh, in their behavioral state, temperature, patterns of breathing, oxygenation, and heart rate. Um, so feasible and possible. We also have good meta analysis from multiple trials in um, all uh, income settings showing that kangaroo care benefits babies. We see reduced neonatal sepsis, improved breastfeeding, improved pain measures. And um, there's the uh, forest plot from the uh, meta-analysis showing reduced mortality risk in babies receiving kangaroo care. Uh, and, and this next one is, is one of my favorite papers, I have to say. It's from Columbia. It's a 20-year follow-up of an RCT looking at kangaroo mother care versus traditional care. And 20 years later, the cohort that were randomized to kangaroo care had reduced hyperactivity, they had reduced school absenteeism, uh, they had enhanced uh, growth on their neuroimaging, and they had better jobs with higher wages. So um, the power of skin to skin and kangaroo care. More recently, we've got neurophysiological studies looking at EEG during skin to skin. We know that babies who have um, skin to skin with their mother on EEG show enhanced maturation um, of their brain patterns and enhanced sleep wake cycling. And um, I'll go back there. The uh, European standards for care of newborn have highlighted this as a very, very important topic. It's of particular importance for the, every very preterm infant. And they advocate that skin to skin contact should be initiated as early as possible as standard care. And really, you can't get any earlier than, than the delivery room. I'm also pleased that the Lancet highlighted this as a health research priority. So there are barriers to continuous skin to skin care early on, and this is a research priority um, from beyond 2015. Um, more recently, we've had some direct studies of delivery room cuddles beyond just kangaroo care and the neonatal environment. There's this lovely case series looking at very preterm babies, and they concluded that those uh, parents who experienced delivery room cuddles had strong um, feelings of, of um, bonding and relief at what they describe as a traumatic time. Uh, Professor Clark also highlighted this recent study looking at surgical defects, not in extreme preterms, but um, we know that actually there's no adverse impotence even in, in babies who have open surgical defects in the delivery room. And those who had delivery room cuddles um, received breast milk more than those who did, had no cuddles. And then there are a couple of RCTs looking directly at the delivery room and skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, this study showing 55 babies, um, the gestational age range was around 28 to 33 plus six, so slightly more mature than the babies we're talking about, but um, showed really feasible to have immediate stabilization even on the maternal chest after delivery. And a similar paper here with 88 babies 
mean gestation 29 weeks, but does go down as far as 25 weeks gestation. And this again, randomized skin to skin contact with visual contact only. Um, these were a select group of very, very well infants, not ones that needed high oxygen levels or intubated. So again, um, we'll advocate that you can, it's possible even in ventilated babies to do this, but um, really pleasingly to see that their primary outcome of mother-child interaction at six months was better in those who had early skin-to-skin -skin contact, not unsurprising. And actually the admission temperature was higher in the skin-to-skin -skin contact group. So delivery room skin-to-skin -skin promotes maternal child interaction, decreases maternal depression, um, decreases bonding problems, and may benefit preterm development. Let's all, all remember those things. In terms of the feasibility in practice, practicing the delivery room cuddle, um, everyone set up in every hospital will be slightly different and there are many contributing factors to how to achieve this safely. Um, we'll all have slightly different equipment, we'll all have a slightly different risk population and our delivery room setups and distances between NICUs and delivery rooms will all be very slightly different. Um, but I honestly think that anyone who is delivering neonatal intensive care has the equipment to deliver a delivery room cuddle um, at the time of birth. Um, risks, I think we shouldn't ignore the human factor. This is a huge element. Um, and uh, we know that whenever we're undertaking something new or, or um, novel to us, it's important to have situational awareness, clear communication, closed loop, a nominated leader, and then have a shared and mutual understanding of the process between the team, which is why it's important that everyone in the team, the nurses, the doctors, uh, and the midwifery team have, have an understanding of this process. Um, if it goes wrong, um, this is an example, this is comical really, um, perhaps not for the footballer, but it certainly wouldn't be comical if, if, if we had poor communication, if we didn't close loop um, our communication and didn't have a shared goal when doing the delivery room. So um, it's very, very important that we acknowledge the human factors involved in this and look to minimize those. Um, as long as we're clear of our communication and we have a shared goal, then we can start focusing on the factors which are intrinsic to the infant, which may put them at risk. So we'll all be aware that extremely preterm babies have very high surface to area volume ratios. They have an absence of insulated subcutaneous tissue. They have very wet skin and limited internal thermoregulatory means, which of course means they're all at risk of hypothermia. Um, there'll be surfactant deficiency in premature lung architecture, which means they'll be at risk of respiratory instability. And of course, there's limited energy stores, particularly if we get them cold or make them work hard with their breathing. And that may place them at risk of hypoglycemia. But honestly, all these things can be controlled. We control them in the neonatal unit. We can control them um, when you've got a whole neonatal team next to this uh, baby and mother in the delivery room. I, I often think there's, there's at no point in this baby's lifetime when they're going to have such a strong um, team supporting them in terms of the seniority and the number of staff that are going to be there in that delivery room. Um, of course, preparation and planning is vital. It's the same when you're preparing for any extremely preterm baby, regardless if you're, you're planning to introduce this practice of, of, of cuddling in the delivery room. But we need to ensure we've got perinatal optimization, of course, delivery in the appropriate center, steroids, magnesium. We need to have a clear plan and communication. This is again why it's vital to have the maternity team involved because we, we need to be clear about if there are any complications or, or contraindications that may preclude a cuddle. Um, and of course, it's vitally important in terms of minimizing the risk of hypothermia that we control the room temperature, minimize drafts and appropriately counsel parents. So um, we don't want to make false promises if, if, if we're going to say, oh, we do delivery cuddles here and then suddenly we don't offer that to the parents, that'd be very bad. Um, but equally, we should strive to where we can and we should just have discussed that this is a potential, particularly if we can stabilize the baby in a way um, that makes it safe. Stabilization, um, the routines, we need to ensure that we've done optimal core clamping. Um, after that, we need to have a definitive respiratory support, whether that's CPAP, intubation, um, high flow, whether or not the baby needs surfactant. And once the monitoring and stabilization is achieved, that's the point at which we look to, to progress to the delivery room cuddle. And this is all in, in, in mine and Paul's papers, along with, with two of the parent authors, Emma and Sheila. We have a little um, assessment criteria to know that the baby is suitable for cuddling. And this is that we can achieve adequate saturations with the potential to increase our ventilation if needed. We have a stable heart rate. Vitally important that we have an adequate temperature 
before starting because if we start a cuddle with a baby cold then they will get cold whereas if we have a good norm of thermia um, then we can maintain that during the cuddle as i've mentioned we want a definitive means of offering respiratory support whatever the baby needs if they're intubated i'd advocate that we should have some form of capnography so that's carbon dioxide monitoring to ensure the tubes in place and we need to think about some of the cautions and contraindications that professor clark explored earlier that may just mean um, in this situation we can't offer the cuddle though, though they are rare um, to highlight again a stabilized infant, a stable airway, definitive respiratory support, optimized firm, firm regulation, no contraindication. The surrounding team, neonatal team, the midwives, the anesthetists, the obstetricians, all updated. And it's very important that the, the team around the neonatal um, nurse and doctor are able to facilitate this. So the logistics are ensuring the mother is ready, ensuring there's a clear path between the baby and the mother to transport the baby there. Um, and making sure that the, the mother is, is, of course, medically fit and not needing emergency care herself. Um, this is very important, um, reassuring the parents. Unless they're, unless they're appropriately counselled as to how the cuddle is going to be facilitated, this could be very, very scary for them indeed. So I like to ensure that the parents are aware we're going to be there with them. The baby is stable for the cuddle. We've assessed that. The baby continues to receive the optimum care. They're being continuously monitored and safe. They're comfortable and, of course, encourage photos and videos of this precious moment because this, this is something that the parents will often look back in and cherish. Um, and then we get to cuddle time. And really, this is just ticking, ticking the boxes, crossing the, the, the T's, making sure that we've got adequate power on medical gases. We've got our continuous monitoring. Um, as part of this that isn't routinely practiced through the UK, I would advocate using continuous temperature monitoring of the babies to ensure that they don't become hypothermic. And um, if we can achieve all this, then the steps taken to ensure the safety of this baby during the cuddle, they represent ongoing intensive care. They're nothing new, but they do represent good practice. Um, equipment will vary between trust and hospital, but you're going to need something to stabilize the baby on or a sussitaire. Uh, you're going to need a plastic bag or suit. You may need a trans warmer. You're, you're going to need a hat cover or a head cover, maybe a hat, maybe a hoodie um, for breathing. You may need to tube the baby, but you're going to need a means of either ventilating that baby or offering CPAP during the cuddle. Um, and for monitoring, you're going to need a means of monitoring their heart rates and SATs, which you know everyone's going to have in the delivery room. I would advocate for an ability to monitor the temperature. I do that by taking the block off my monitor in the ward and take it down to the delivery room. But actually, um, most resuscitators also have a temperature monitor. And then, of course, I've mentioned there that continuous carbon dioxide monitoring is important to check that ventilation is ongoing and the endotracheal tube is actually in the trachea. Um, and I've got a picture there you can see just of the resuscitator showing that um, most of them will have a skin temp probe. Uh, and it's just about finding the lead, to be honest. Um, so there are different ways of transporting baby to the mother. Uh, if you've got a good transport incubator, then you may like to transfer the baby into that incubator and then move the incubator alongside the mother and then offer your invasive ventilation or non-invasive ventilation using that in the transport incubator's ventilator. Um, I like to do that because my model will allow me to give uh, volume targeted, but that's not essential. Um, and you can then have your monitoring system next to baby there as well. The other possibility is moving the resuscitator next to the baby as shown here. And you may like just to use the Neopuff to offer your um, ventilation via an ETT tube. Um, or it can be possible to use a mask over the nose and mouth of the baby and offer CPAP in that regard, although this does require a skilled operator. Um, this is all available, as I said, in our um, open access paper in ACTA. Uh, during the cuddle, there are other things that can be done. As I said, the infant's care isn't put on hold. Um, you can think ahead, you can notify NICU that the baby's ready, we're doing the cuddle, um, we'll be coming to you shortly. You can prescribe infusions, have antibiotics, caffeine, vitamin K ready, and of course NICU team can have their ventilation ready, um, their access trolley ready and have all their infusions and syringe drives ready. So if you work as a team uh, and work in parallel rather than in serial, then you can achieve a lot 
and certainly um, this doesn't take up any time. And as we've seen from our case series, there was no difference in time to admission between babies who had a cuddle and didn't. It's a very special moment. Here again is Jack receiving his delivery room cuddle. You can see that he's got um, his ET and is receiving his ventilation via a Neopuff. And this is an example of, um, I think this is a 33 weeker receiving delivery room cuddle CPAP with use of um, the face mask there. So um, really just to summarize, plan, plan and prepare, ensure you've got firmer regulation, respiratory st stability and a definitive airway, um, whether that's the baby's own airway or an intercule tube, prepare the team, prepare the parents, have monitoring throughout and encourage photographs and videos. So ongoing attention to firmer regulation, ongoing provision of respiratory support, effective monitoring, high risk human factors can be controlled with good communication and the steps taken to achieve this cuddle are good practice and enhance the baby's care. Um, finally, uh, hopefully many of you will be looking to encourage us on your unit if you're not doing it already. I think it's important to have, um, ha have a, a good plan in place before you just offer this to any extreme preterm baby, particularly with those human factors, there are risks that need controlling. You can control them with a guideline training simulation. You can start off with bigger babies and then go to smaller ones. Then you're well rehearsed when the tiniest do come. Um, you're going to need MTT involvement. So you, the midwifery team, the obstetricians, the anesthetists, and of course, the neonatal team and local champions are vital to disseminate knowledge, troubleshoot and stoke enthusiasm. Uh, and finally, as you've, we've shown, I think audit and governance as with any new practice is very important. Um, I'll end here with our paper, which you're welcome to have a look at. Um, it's open access, there's lots of supplementary resorts. Those vid pa very powerful videos that, that Professor Clark showed are also available online um, for you to be able to, 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 to watch and share as well. And um, again, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I, I know myself and Professor Clark are very happy to answer any ongoing questions relating to this. Fabulous. Thank you so much. That was really, really thought provoking. I think you illustrated for me all the things that we need to think about. And that's the planning, 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 the teamwork that that really does illustrate working together so strongly and really well and timing. Um, and the magic word thermoregulation, which is on my mind for another reason. So it's, it's kind of all the things that are really important while you're working on it. And just reiterate to the audience, this lovely, lovely publication that Paul was talking about, which is available online. And it's got all the, it, it's a lovely thing to read, very straightforward. It's got loads of information and it's got all those wonderful pictures of the whole, the whole steps. So if you wanted to share this with anyone or use it for a, a, a project in your own unit, this has it all. And, and obviously all the other, um, pieces of research. I don't think we've got all of them on the resource list, but we will have them on the resource list at some point. So thank you very much to our wonderful speakers. We're going to put them on the spot now with a few questions. We've had a few questions coming through. And the reason to the audience I'm looking over here is because I have a, the questions coming through on another screen, I'm not, you know, not losing, losing your faces. Um, so we have a, a, a question from Paula Loftus. Hi, Paula who says, is it not possible to deliver immediately onto the bare chest, then cover to keep warm and stabilise in that position? Remembering this is a very low, mm. very preterm baby. Good um, question, Paula. <laughs> really good question. Um, and and um, there was that, that, that was done in that RCT um, from 20, well, published in 2020. Um, uh, I think there's 88 babies in that one and they, they had stabilization on the maternal chest and um, kept the baby there for an hour actually. Um, it perhaps is technically feasible um, but um, I, I would find that you, you would need a very open operating room or delivery room with a lot of space um, to, to, to be able to get to the baby and, and do mm. that. Um, so I think that would be a lot more involved than stabilizing the baby and bringing the baby over. Um, mm. I think it would be really helpful to hear the parents' opinion on on 
if they think it, it would make a difference to have the baby stabilized on, on the chest or if you know they would rather the stabilization somewhere they mm. can see but on the resuscitator tear and then mm. the baby brought over um but i would say from a neonatologist comfort point of view i'd certainly like to stabilize the baby first where i've got all my equipment and facilities and easy reach um there's some beautiful work um between um i forget which formula one team it was but the deformed one team and the, the team at bath looking at spacing around the resuscitator and um I, I think you can achieve a lot around a resuscitator that would be more challenging at a mother's side yeah yeah and of course if you're intubating which you usually would have to i would assume it's probably quite tricky with a small with a small baby in a small space i guess yeah i I would argue so and i think um yeah you'd have to have a lot of practice and to prior Mm. to 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 achieving that but it's not a ridiculous idea because it has been tested in slightly mature infants than the ones we 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 um, had our review on um no that's great okay i hope that answers the question paula we've got a question from claire dale Hi, Claire. She says, depending on gestation and condition, could a feed, i.e. a breastfeed, be attempted during the cuddle? Now, none of those babies looked as though they were able to have a breastfeed. I don't know whether Paul Clark would want to comment on that. Yeah, um, (laughs) thank you, Claire, for the question. Um, Again, this talk, we've focused on the extremely preterm babies. Hmm. Um, I think for good reason, because we wanted to demonstrate it can be done in the most preterm babies mm. um, the trickiest ones the ones who need the most stabilization inevitably um, so unfortunately feeding is certainly in the delivery room lower down the list um, because obviously the airway and circulation takes the priority here plus the temperature um, mm. but it's, it's not far behind and it's it, it's part of certainly when we're speaking to the mums before the delivery is one of the important things we do emphasize mm. the importance of the breast milk production. Um, and I, I hope we've been able to share a couple of examples here where the mums have felt the cuddle has helped their milk supply, mm. even from very early on. Um, as regards actually giving a breastfeed during the cuddle, it's certainly possible in the, in the less premature babies, but here, mm. you know, less than 27 weeks, it, it's not going to be possible, really. There'd mm. be worries about aspiration, and, I mean, the babies haven't got meaningful suck anyway until around 32, 34 weeks gestation. Mm. I know in our unit, it's probably fairly similarly nationally, babies aren't allowed to suck feed until around 34 weeks gestation for that developmental reason. Um, but good question. And I think you, you did actually, you, it did emphasize when you were presenting that, the, the mothers who were able to have their cuddles were more likely to breastfeed than successfully breastfeed. So it's obviously not on a forgotten list. It's, it's mm-hmm. fairly, I think you expressed that really well. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we have Sue Henry. Hi, Sue. She says, do you have any suggestions about optimal ways to train staff in delivery room cuddles? Thank you, she says. Trying to take that one, Paul. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, hopefully the paper does have um, some easy to, to follow practical diagrams that could easily be adopted into a guideline. Um, that the best way is to have a guideline which has been agreed by a group, um, so you know that everyone at the unit is on board. The last thing you want is is for there to be um, uh, disagreements about whether this should be done, and then. Um, disharmony that would never work um, mm-hmm. so a guideline agree it ratify it and then um, do simulation and um, practice what it's actually going to look like with the equipment you have you know will will your lines reach will the power supply reach do you have adequate gas supplies mm-hmm. um, get that all done on a dole first um, and then everyone will feel a lot more confident about um, doing it in, when it comes to the real thing mm-hmm. And I think in the paper, we, we do have a section about implementing it and trying to make it establish an, as a new practice. And we talk about the having champions for it amongst midwifery, mm-hmm. as well as neonatal nurses, as well as doctors um, who, who can teach and train and stimulate mm-hmm. and make it the acceptance. But it, it takes time. It's not something that can happen overnight. I mean, as I said, here in Norwich, we've done it for 
15 plus years now but it was very sporadic early on uh, mm. sporadic early on but now it's it's the norm no one blinks an eyelid about it mm. and the, the parents don't either they take it as why would you ever not do that so mm. it, it, it certainly can be done and should be done I think mm. now that's I mean that's I think it's uh, it's it's an interesting because both of you are talking about skin to skin care and the benefits of that and that's something that I know that many midwives who are watching it's very close to their heart so it's almost like a step along but having said that some of these babies are very tiny and maybe some practitioners aren't quite as confident with dealing with such tiny babies and I wonder if that's why there was always used to be a rush to get any tiny baby away mm -hmm. quickly get the baby to NICU because it, it feels kind of scary and a bit dangerous. And you, you've, you've both spoken very beautifully about dealing with that. Yes, thanks. And, and I hope the videos really show the, the, the peace and calm in the room mm. at the time of the cuddle. It's, it's such an amazing moment, actually, to be part of it. And we are part of it. We're, we're right there amongst the, the mom and the dad and the baby. Um, it's a beautiful time. It, it, you know, there's hard to express, find the right words to express how privileged you feel in that position. Mm. But it is so calm. And, and what you saw there is the way it is in practice. You know, we've got the whole team stood by, being quiet and just letting the family enjoy those precious moments together. But there, if needed, um, we, we've not really said anything about, well, it's in the paper, actually, the safety of it. We've not seen any in our practice, any tube dislocations um, during the cuddle. Mm. I'm sure it'll happen one day somewhere, but and we're ready for it if it does happen. Um, but, you know, it, 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 the baby can't be more stable at that moment. And there's absolutely no reason to rush the baby away to the neonatal unit. Those should be the, the moments for the baby to spend back with its mother and the mother to have a baby back with her because it's going to be a long separation, weeks and months ahead. And actually, I'll, I'll, also, I noticed with the one of the images with the father as well. And he seemed to get more confident the longer the baby was being cuddled, which was lovely. Mm. Sorry, Paul Corley. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so um, I was just going to say, yeah, um, it, the, the cuddle definitely calms the team down. It gives everyone a, a okay. moment to pause and reflect because undoubtedly with, within the, the medical nursing and, and maternity teams, there will be a lot of adrenaline and, and nervousness yeah. because this is a, a high risk delivery. Um, but that moment of um, the baby being cuddled is, is something which is enjoyed by the whole team. And, and I think calms the team down and, and is beneficial mm -hmm. after admission to the NICU is, is my experience of it. Okay. Um, and, and your point about skin to skin as well as I think as we've shown is we still, uh, we still um, have the baby in, in a plastic bag or in a, in a hoodie and we have pre warm towel to put around and we have a trans warmer. So there may not be direct skin to skin, um, but mm -hmm. you're getting all the other benefits of that close contact. Mm -hmm. And there's that really lovely moment in that second video of, of the mother kissing the baby during the cuddle. Um, mm. I mean, that is skin to skin, isn't it? So, yeah. Absolutely. No, it was lovely. I, I like the idea that it's actually calming the staff. Mm. That's fantastic because you're quite right. Everyone's a bit uh, haunched up about that. That's grand. OK, we'll see if we've got any more questions. Uh, Nicola Clark wants to know how much antenatal education do you give parents? I'm not sure if. Either of you want to answer that one? So if we're, in, yeah, if we're involved, it's, it's usually in the immediate antenatal period. Yeah. Obviously, we never know which babies from early in pregnancy are going to deliver prematurely. But if we're called, and, and as part of our um, antenatal discussions where it is possible with parents, we, we do cover it and spend a couple of minutes telling them what will happen immediately following the delivery. So mm. they're well aware of what the whole procedure will be. They're aware of not to panic when the baby's brought to the resource turn. That will be 10 or 15 or 20 minutes before the baby's ready to bring back to mum. So the, the, we, it's part and parcel of our routine um, counselling immediately before the delivery, whether that's a few days or a couple of weeks before for the mums who are around on the antenatal wards for a while. Mm. Fabulous. Thank you. That's lovely. Okay. Thank you. And I hope that answers that for you, Nicola. I've got a comment rather than a question from Stephanie Michael Edis. Hi, Stephanie. She says, well done for managing to have the theatre temperature above 26 centigrade. It's a shame this is not the standard in all trusts. There we are, a little arm twisting there, brother <laughs> trusts. And some, some lovely feedback. 
Um, we've got Charlotte Easton. Hi, Charlotte, who says, and that's absolutely amazing. Thank you for sharing. Ali X Hanley says, how lovely. Lovely gentleman. That's lovely, too. <laughs> And Nicola Clark says, excellent presentation and sharing of expert experiences. Thank you. And Daphne Kelly says, thank you. Excellent pr presentations and thought provoking. And I will echo those because it's fantastic. We come kind of to the end of our presentation now. And, and I want to say a big thank you to Paul Clark and Paul Corley for joining us uh, and sharing their expertise. And I will really recommend to the audience, if you read nothing else, read this article because it's got everything you would need. But we there are other resources that you can um, have a look at which will help you. And I hope that maybe this will cascade a little further into the maternity and neonatal world because when you see those the looks on those mums' faces and the dads, and the baby's response, it, it's just amazing. And I think we should try to think about, even when you think about five, 10 minutes of that little cuddle can mean so much, especially if the mother loses the child later on. You know, even that little memory is going to help cope, her cope with that, that loss a little. So thank you so much to Paul and Paul. I have to bring it, us to now to um, a video clip. Uh, and this is a little uh, new kind of development for Matflix, who look after the Maternity and Midwifery Hour and Maternity and Midwifery Festival. And I'm hoping by some marvellous electronic magic that this will just happen. A big, a big thank, thank you, you to, to Sue McDonald. Um, she's been the curator of most of the festivals and Maternity and Midwifery Hours that these videos have been recorded at. So this is a big day for us at Matflix. We have finally cleared all the hurdles to get on to Open Athens for access in universities, trusts, companies, and anybody else that uses those kinds of systems. So uh, if you're at university, if you're a teacher, if you're a student, then you can get uh, Matflix onto your Open Athens system and begin to access everything. We've published over a thousand maternity and midwifery videos over the past few years and they've been watched in over 180 countries. Um, but everyone fed back that searching through them and trying to pull them together into presentations was something they would like us to do and to improve the cataloging. So we're now launching expert box sets and we'll be giving access to people through open access to the huge uh, archive of a thousand of some of the best presentations from uh, maternity experts around the world. The thing about these box sets is that they allow you to find presentations by topic. Uh, they include invaluable research indexes and workbooks, and they provide you with video content you know you can trust. Uh, besides Sue McDonald's work in curating the original programs and recordings, the box sets have been edited by uh, Jenny Hall, uh, former editor at The Practicing Midwife and somebody that many educators will know from her time in Bournemouth. Uh, it also saves time and money for educators and employers. It's from trusted experts, trusted selections that are manageable size, size, ideal for training and study, and you can use them and we found people using them to rehearse for applying for jobs so and good for reflective learning. And we already have a whole string of box sets out and we'll be releasing a new one almost every week through the rest of this year. So the new institutional subscriptions for universities uh, and trusts are on Open Athens now. There's three levels of subscription, one just for students, one for students and staff who want to use it in teaching, want to use clips, and also want to point students towards it for the flipped classroom. And there's also institution-wide subscriptions, so not just for maternity and midwifery students, but for all those uh, medical students, social science students, people doing women's studies, for whom what's happening in maternity and midwifery is really important. So this is a big step up for Matflix. It's a big new service. It helps fund the maternity and midwifery hour and the festivals and keep those bits free. So I hope you'll look into it and I hope you can champion it with your institutions. Um, and again, a big thanks to Sue McDonald and to Jenny Hall for all their curating and editorial work.
And thank you so much, Neil Stewart, our director. Fantastic to hear all of this, all available now. And th just remember that this whole um, session will be available through our norm networks by the end of the week. Remember, you can share with your colleagues. You might want to relook really at, at, at the, the whole presentation. Lots of information there, lots and lots. Lots of um, literature to, to look at in the videos. And you can share with your colleagues. And it, it's a good discussion point because it might just make people think, hmm, we could try that here. And then you could try the steps all in this wonderful article here. So fabulous. So thank you again to our Paul Clark and Paul Corley for joining us this evening. Fantastic. I think we might have to have them back again. Well, I always say once we've had you and we've got you, we always <laughs> like to re <laughs> invite you again. So um, I'm just going to say, don't forget to book for next week's maternity and midwifery hour. We've got postnatal care. Who cares? And we've got Elizabeth Duff from the NCT and Professor Mary Steen, who's Professor of Midwifery at Northumbria University, joining us. In the, and the London and Maternity Festival on the 1st of March in London. You can either join us in London or you can join us virtually. We're very hybrid, as you know. And in the meantime, stay so, safe and well. Look after yourselves and your loved ones. If you're into it, get your vaccination. It, it's not that bad. It's really good. And we'll see you next week. So take care.